happy Saturday and Merry Christmas to those who are celebrating. Since today's episode is coming out on Christmas Day, we thought we would replay a particularly Christmassy episode as our Saturday classic. And it is our Christmas triple feature, which originally came out on December 24th, 2018, and covers three Christmas classics that were each having milestone birthdays that year. So enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Today's podcast is coming out on Christmas Eve 2018. So it seemed like a good time to take a look at three creative works that have become staples of the Christmas season. All three of them have played a huge part and how people observe and celebrate Christmas in parts of the world. And they all happen to have milestone birthdays this year. So A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens turned 175 on December 19th. The poem A Visit from St. Nicholas turned 195 on December 23rd. Probably. We're going to talk a little bit about that too. And then the song Still a Nacht or Silent Night is turning 200 on the day that this episode comes out. Uh, I will tell you that if you had asked me before any of this research landed in my hand, I would have reversed the order that I believed they were in terms of age. You would have put the, you would have put Silent Night as the youngest one? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why. But in my brain, it seems newer. I don't know why. Um, (laughs) I think, I bet it has to do with perception that I always see a Christmas carol or I have often seen a Christmas carol played out in old-timey costumes, and that has not oh, yeah. been the case with the other two. So in my head, those must be <laughs> those must be the younger ones. I think that's what it is. But we are going to start with the youngest of these three works, and that is Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol in Prose Being a Ghost Story of Christmas, first published by Chapman and Hall on December 19th, 1843. And this novella begins with the author's note, quote, I have endeavored in this ghostly little book to raise the ghost of an idea which shall not put my readers out of humor with themselves, with each other, with the season, or with me. May it haunt their houses pleasantly, and no one wish to lay it. Their faithful friend and servant, C.D. Uh, Today's readers may miss the double meaning of to lay it, which meant both to lay the book down and to lay the ghost Dickens was raising to rest. Then the book moves on to the relatively un-Christmassy opening line of Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatsoever about that. Then it introduces Ebenezer Scrooge, quote, a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old center. There's also his jolly and kind-hearted nephew, Fred, his ill-treated employee, Bob Cratchit, Cratchit's son, Tiny Tim, and the ghosts of Marley and the spirits of Christmas past, present, and yet to come. The story, of course, follows Scrooge as he becomes a kinder and more generous person through the intervention of all these spirits. God bless us, everyone. A Christmas Carol is commonly named as one of the best-selling books of all time. But because of its age, that's actually pretty tricky to confirm. And at this point, there are also hundreds and hundreds of adaptations across many genres and many types of media. You can see flickers of it in everything from It's a Wonderful Life to How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And none of this colossal popularity is new. When it was first published in 1843, its first run of 6,000 copies sold out in just a week. And within two months of its debut, eight different dramatic versions were already being staged. But Charles Dickens didn't originally set out to write a book when he wrote A Christmas Carol. His original intent was a pamphlet. Earlier in 1843, he had read a report on child labor in Britain, and he had also visited what he described as a ragged school. Urbanization, industrialization, and the 1834 poor laws had all combined to create a system of really devastating poverty in 19th century England. Conditions at a lot of the factories were just appalling, and children employed in the factories frequently did exhausting and dangerous work. This whole system was also set up so that the poor were forced to go work in workhouses, but the conditions at those workhouses were so terrible and dehumanizing that people would do anything rather than to go there. 
Dickens's thoughts on all of this were certainly influenced by his own lived experience. When he was a child, his father was placed in a debtor's prison over an unpaid bakery bill. Dickens had to leave school and work in a boot blacking factory. So Dickens wanted to do something about all of this, and he initially planned a pamphlet called An Appeal to the People of England on Behalf of the Poor Man's Child. But he quickly decided that a work of fiction might do a better job of getting his point across than a pamphlet would. He also had a practical motivation to write a book instead of a pamphlet. He flat out needed money. He had just come back from a tour of the U.S. where he had been treated like a celebrity, but he hadn't earned very much. So he needed to write a work that would sell, and that meant a book, not a pamphlet. He cranked out A Christmas Carol over just a couple months of writing while also working on The Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit as a serial. He's described as basically the most famous writer living at that moment. And so he went on this whole tour of the U.S. and Canada and was just hailed everywhere that he went, uh, but did not earn (laughs) money off of it. A Christmas Carol really synthesizes a lot that was going on at the time that it was written. There's the Victorian fascination with ghosts and the supernatural, the horrors of poverty and morality, The character of Ebenezer Scrooge really embodies commonly held attitudes toward the poor, seeing them as a burden on society who just deserved the cruelties and degradations of the workhouse. The celebration of Christmas in Britain was also shifting during this time. Christmas trees, turkey dinners, decorating with evergreens, gifts, and greeting cards were all becoming more and more popular. So A Christmas Carol both reflected and reinforced the Victorian idea of how to celebrate Christmas. It's also credited with popularizing Merry Christmas as a Christmas greeting and with the idea that there should be snow at Christmas. Even though A Christmas Carol was an instant bestseller, Dickens did not make nearly as much money with it as he hoped, and this was mostly because of his own decisions. He wanted this book to be really nice, with fancy gilded bindings and woodcuts and edgings and extravagant lettering. All that stuff cost money. He even made last-minute changes to the title and end pages of the books because he wasn't satisfied with the original versions. All of this was very expensive and cut very deeply into his profits. That entire first printing only netted 230 pounds, and that was a fraction of the thousand pounds that he had hoped to make off of this book. In its first year, A Christmas Carol sold 15,000 copies, and even after that, he still was not anywhere close to that thousand pound mark. It's like he needed a a business manager to explain, like, how the balance of, of profit works. Um, And while the book was not a financial success at all, it was incredibly well-received. It was nicknamed A New Gospel. William Makepeace Thackeray described it as, quote, a national benefit, and to every man and woman who reads it, a personal kindness. It also appears to have inspired exactly the kind of charitable mindset that Dickens had hoped that it would when he decided to write it. The following spring, Gentleman's Magazine reported, quote, more extensive kindness has been dispensed to those who are in want at the present season than at any preceding one. Later on, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote to a friend that after reading this book, he wanted to, quote, go out and comfort someone. And he insisted in the same letter that the idea of not handing out money to people who needed it was just nonsense. On top of all that, A Christmas Carol launched the genre of Christmas books. It also popularized the genre of Christmas ghost stories, although the British tradition of telling ghost stories around a fire in winter definitely predates Dickens's work. Dickens faced this disparity between how his book was received and how much money he made off of it with a lot of frustration. He summed up his chagrin in a letter saying, quote, what a wonderful thing it is that such a great success should occasion me such intolerable anxiety and disappointment. It took him more than 10 years after this book came out to really get on stable financial footing. At the same time, though, he was genuinely glad that it inspired such a wave of seasonal goodwill and really spread the idea that employers had a duty not to be completely horrible to their employees. I don't know why that tickles me, but it does. Uh, Today, Dickens' original handwritten manuscript of A Christmas Carol is at the Morgan Library and Museum in New York City, and they put it on display there every Christmas season. I don't think I have been at the Morgan 
at exactly the time when they're showing it. But w- when I realized that, I was like, do I need to go to New York between now and the end of the year? Maybe. I don't think I do. We will get into our next little piece of culture uh, after a quick sponsor break. People may know our next subject, which is the poem A Visit from St. Nicholas by another name, The Night Before Christmas. A Visit from St. Nicholas is sometimes also called An Account of a Visit from St. Nicholas, and it was first published in the Troy Sentinel of Troy, New York, on December 23rd, 1823. This is the one that starts, "'Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse.'" The narrator and his wife in the story are settling in for bed when St. Nicholas arrives in a miniature sleigh pulled by eight tiny reindeer. In the first printing, they were named Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Dunder, and Blixum. Not Blitzen. Uh, St. Nicholas is (laughs) is described as chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. He comes down the chimney with a bound, he fills all the stockings with presents, and then he goes back up the chimney before flying away, exclaiming, Happy Christmas to all and to all a good night. Similarly to how A Christmas Carol really reinforced and spread the way that the Victorians were celebrating Christmas, this poem had a huge effect on how people think about Christmas, especially St. Nick. Among other things, a visit from St. Nicholas really cemented jolly old St. Nick as this rotund and laughing person with twinkling eyes and a sleigh pulled by eight reindeer who comes into people's homes by sliding down the chimney. That's not the first ever appearance of sliding down the the chimney, but it did really popularize all of that. And then there are also the sugar plums, which went on to become a prominent part of the Nutcracker Suite in 1892. After that first appearance of the poem in 1823, the Troy Sentinel reprinted A Visit from St. Nicholas every year, still anonymously. Over the years, it went through various edits, mostly related to changes in spelling. For example, in earlier editions of the poem, the narrator sprung from the bed, but later he sprang. And of course, Dunder and Blixum became Dunder Mifflin. No, I'm kidding, became Donner and Blitzen. Uh, The poem was picked up in other publications as well. As this poem grew in popularity, people started writing in to the Troy Sentinel to talk about or to ask about who the author was. In 1829, the paper printed that they could only say that it was someone, quote, by birth and residence to the city of New York, and that he is a gentleman of more merit as a scholar and a writer than many of more noisy pretensions. Then in 1837, Charles Fenno Hoffman published a book called New York Book of Poetry, in which he named the author of A Visit from St. Nicholas as his friend, Clement Clark Moore. Moore was a scholar and a professor at the General Theological Seminary in New York City, where he taught subjects such as Hebrew and Greek literature. His other works included a two-volume compendious lexicon of the Hebrew language. At first, Moore didn't really acknowledge Hoffman's claim that he had written a visit from St. Nicholas, but in 1844, he included the work in an anthology of his poetry. He said that he had written it for his children back in 1822 and that he had never intended for it to be made public outside their family at all. The most common explanation for how it came to be in the pages of the Troy Sentinel was that a family friend named Sarah Harriet Butler had visited that Christmas of 1822 and taken a copy of this family poem home with her and then sent it to the Sentinel the following year without telling more about it. In 1862, the librarian of the New York Historical Society asked Moore to handwrite a copy of it for their collections, and he did. You can see a scan of it online at the New York Historical Society Museum and Library website. At the time, the Society's librarian noted that when they were discussing this request for a manuscript, Moore said his inspiration for his depiction of St. Nick was, quote, a portly, rubicund Dutchman living in the neighborhood. He wrote out other copies of the poem on request as well. However... There's also a competing claim to the authorship of A Visit from St. Nicholas. Descendants of Major Henry Livingston Jr. had said that he, not Moore, was the one who wrote the poem all the way back in roughly 1808. 
A few years after the 1844 anthology of Moore's poetry came out, the Livingstons learned about it, and various members of the family started writing to each other about how Moore was taking credit for their father or grandfather's poem, depending on who was doing the writing. But they didn't really go public with their allegations until the early 1900s. By that point, all they really had to go on with this claim was their family lore. The family members who had said they had personal memories of it had all died, and then Livingston himself had been dead for 16 years when Moore's anthology came out. So even when that anthology came out, they could not just go ask him, hey, is this the poem that you wrote? There is no original handwritten copy of A Visit from St. Nicholas from 1808 or 1822. The Livingston family said they had a manuscript with handwritten notes, but that it was destroyed in a fire around 1859. So this has spawned a debate over who should actually get credit. Moore's supporters have pointed out that the Troy Sentinel described the poet as a scholar from New York City. Moore was a scholar and was born in New York City. And when this poem was first published, he was living in an estate in Chelsea, Manhattan. Livingston, on the other hand, was neither a scholar nor from New York City. He was sort of a gentleman farmer living in Poughkeepsie, roughly 80 miles or 129 kilometers north of New York City. Moore's supporters also question why Moore would take credit for the poem if he didn't write it, going so far as to write out copies for historical collections, especially since he seemed kind of embarrassed that it had even been published in the first place. Moore's detractors, on the other hand, have contended that he was too preachy and cranky to have written such a lighthearted poem and also that he hated children. They've also noted that Moore's family members gave three completely different stories about what inspired him to write it. One was that it was written to cheer up a son after he was thrown from a horse and broke his leg. Another was that he wrote it after having to go out on Christmas Eve to find a turkey after the butcher didn't deliver theirs. And the last was that it was written after hearing the bells jingling on his horse while traveling to his Chelsea estate by sleigh. So they point to the existence of these three disparate stories as a sign that none of them are true. Some of those spelling changes made to the poem over the years have also been brought up as evidence that Moore did not write it, especially Dunder and Blixem to Donner and Blitzen. Dunder and Blixem is supposedly derived from the Dutch words for thunder and lightning, and Livingston spoke Dutch. However, Moore spoke German, and Donner und Blitz is German for thunder and lightning. Yeah, Dunder and Donner are really the words for thunder, Neither Blixem nor Blitzen is exactly the word for lightning. It's close in those two languages. Moore's detractors have also brought up a handwritten note on the title page of a book that he donated to the New York Historical Society. The note says, by Clement C. Moore, A.M., This book is a translation of another work, and Moore's detractors say that this is evidence that he made a habit of just taking credit for other people's work, but his supporters counter that this note is not even in his handwriting and that it's probably not him trying to say, I translated this book, but it's just a notation written by someone else at the Historical Society to mark who donated the book. Today, Livingston's supporters include Donald Foster of Vassar College, who wrote author unknown, on the trail of Anonymous, and McDonald P. Jackson of the University of Auckland, author of Who Wrote the Night Before Christmas, analyzing the Clement Clark Moore versus Henry Livingston question. Both Foster and Jackson ground their arguments in linguistic forensics, with Jackson's book having such chapter titles as The Evidence of Meter, Statistical Interlude, Phoneme Pairs, Definite and Indefinite Articles, and Favorite Expressions and Quirks of Style. Both of these men argue that the poem uses language in a way that makes it more likely to be Livingston's than Moore's. In Jackson's analysis, the most important part is, quote, the frequencies of common words, such as the, on, as, at, to, that, would, and some, locutions such as menia and in vain, and phoneme pairs, comprised of the last phonetic symbol on in one word and the first in the next Jackson goes on to state that these elements of language are not easy to imitate and are outside the conscious control of a writer. 
After Foster's book, Author Unknown, was published, historic document dealer Seth Caller published a point-by-point rebuttal of the various claims against Clement Moore as author of A Visit from St. Nicholas, including Foster's forensic analysis. When it comes to the more subjective claims of things like Moore's temperament, Keller's response is sort of, no, he wasn't a jerky pedant who hated kids. Here are examples. But when it came to the linguistic analysis, Keller contended that Foster cherry-picked the evidence that supported the idea that Livingston was the author, while discarding everything that did not support his idea. Keller concludes unequivocally that Moore wrote the poem. McDonald P. Jackson's book just came out in April of 2016, so it is really new. And there really has not been a lot of scrutiny into whether his analysis holds up. I found one blog post on that subject and nothing in any peer-reviewed journal or anything like that. The book author unknown is much older, so there's been a lot more writing about whether those conclusions are valid. However, it's important to note that there is debate about whether linguistic forensics can reliably and conclusively identify the author of a work at all, especially as the field stands right now. The field itself is kind of divided over this issue of can linguistic forensics conclusively identify the author of an unknown work. And several of Foster's other attempts to use forensic linguistics in criminal investigations have been completely wrong. This includes falsely implicating the wrong man in the September 2011 anthrax attacks in the United States, which led to a massive defamation suit. Keller, Jackson, and Foster are just the latest round of people to weigh in on this topic. It's been the subject of ongoing debate since about 1920. And at this point, you will find the poem attributed in a lot of different ways. Encyclopedia Britannica's entry on the poem attributes it to neither man, but acknowledges the issue of its authorship in a paragraph. The Academy of American Poets lists more as the author, as do various publications from the U.S. Library of Congress. The Poetry Foundation confusingly has the poem on two different pages on its website, one attributed to Moore and the other attributed to Livingston. Livingston's biography at the Poetry Foundation lists him unequivocally as the author, while Moore's points out the lack of concrete evidence in Livingston's claim before saying, scholars today give the credit to Livingston. I don't know what scholars are talking about. (laughs) Uh, I am not a linguist, I am not a forensic scientist, but as a poet, I find the idea that you can conclusively determine who the author was of a 500-and-something word poem with some computer analysis, I find that specious. (laughs) Uh, I was having a conversation with somebody um, about this yesterday, and I, I think that Uh, forensic linguistics has the potential to someday be sort of like fingerprinting in terms of identifying people. But at this point, it's a lot more like phrenology. So that's my... uh, I read a lot of very frustrating charts of words in their use in different works by Clement Moore and uh, and Livingston, and I, I found it all very frustrating. And as a side note... This is not the only he said, she said back and forth about the authorship of a Christmas classic. Medford, Massachusetts, and Savannah, Georgia, two cities I cannot think of more different from one another, have both claimed to be the place where James Pierpont wrote Jingle Bells. They even have their own plaque about it, each city having a plaque saying this is where where he wrote Jingle Bells. Over the last couple of years, there's been a whole other argument raised about that author or that location of where it was written, which is that it might not be either of them. They might both be wrong. Uh, Both cities, however, feel extremely passionately about it. And we are going to move on to something that, that has a much clearer authorship after another quick break. The song Stille Nacht, known in English as Silent Night or Silent Night, Holy Night, was created in the 18-teens. And since neither Holly nor I speak German, we do not want to traumatize people with a, a like, preschoolerish attempt to read lyrics in German. Instead, here is the beginning of the song from a 1914 recording sung by Julia Culp.
most common English translation of this song is by Episcopal priest John Freeman Young, who was born in Pittston, Maine, and later became Bishop of Florida. His 1859 version starts, Silent night, holy night. All is calm, all is bright. Round yon virgin, mother and child. Holy infant, so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. The original German lyrics to Stille Nacht were written by Joseph Moore. Moore had been born into poverty in Salzburg on December 11, 1792, and when he was still a child, a local priest started mentoring him and saw that he had a talent for music. This priest helped him get an education, including studying music at a Benedictine monastery. Moore also attended the Lyceum School in Salzburg. In 1811, Moore entered seminary, something that he had to get a special dispensation to do because his parents had not been married. He was ordained in 1815, and in 1816, he moved to the town of Mariepfar in Lungau in the Austrian Alps for his first assignment as an assistant priest. And this area was also where his father's family was from. And it was where he wrote the poem that would become the lyrics to Silent Night in 1816. He never described a specific inspiration for the poem, but Maria Farr, which translates to Mary's parish, had been the spiritual and religious heart of the Lungau region for centuries, and it had also really, really struggled in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars. It had been occupied by Bavarian troops, and those troops were finally withdrawing at about the same time that Moore started working there. So it makes a lot of sense that all of this would come together to inspire a poem about the birth of Christ that prominently featured the themes of peace, love, and salvation. Working as an assistant priest required Moore to move from place to place, and by 1818, he had arrived in Obendorf by Salzburg, roughly 80 miles, that's about 130 kilometers, northwest of Maria Pfarr on the Austrian border. And like Maria Pfarr, this region had been through its share of turmoil. Starting in the 13th century, it had been part of a state that was ruled by the prince archbishops of the city of Salzburg. But in 1803, it had been forced to secularize. Then, after the Napoleonic Wars, the Congress of Vienna drew a new border through the region. And what had been its own entity was divided up and absorbed into Austria and Bavaria. Part of this new border followed the Salzach River, which ran directly through town. And so what had been one municipality became Obendorf by Salzburg, Austria on the east side of the river, and Laufen, Bavaria on the west. The war had also affected the salt trade, which was a major part of the local economy. So laborers and boat builders who made up most of the population of Obendorf were really struggling. After the new border was drawn, a parish was established at Obendorf by Salzburg at the Church of St. Nicholas, and that is where Moore became assistant priest in 1818. And as a side note, Moore did not get along with the parish priest there who accused him of, among other things, singing songs which do not edify. The organist at the Church of St. Nicholas was a man named Franz Xaver Gruber. Gruber was born on November 25th, 1787, and his parents were linen weavers. But his real interest was in music, and his teacher encouraged this interest and gave him some music lessons outside of his regular studies. At first, Gruber went into the family linen business, but when he turned 18, his father gave him permission to find work as a teacher. Gruber hoped that teaching would let him keep pursuing music. It was pretty common for teachers to also work as church organists. He found an internship with another organist, and he got his first job as a teacher in 1807. In 1818, he was working as the organist at the Church of St. Nicholas, along with working as a school teacher, a church caretaker, and as organist at another church. On Christmas Eve, 1818, Moore went to Gruber and asked him to write a melody to go along with that poem he had written two years earlier. Moore wanted something suitable for a choir with two soloists accompanied by a guitar. And it's not totally clear what prompted this request. One hypothesis is that the church organ was broken. Today, there are a lot of really dramatic explanations for what was wrong with the organ, including a mouse infestation. (laughs) That's really not uh, substantiated in any way, and the fact that the organ was broken is really speculative. (laughs) Whatever the reason, 
Gruber wrote the music and presented it to Moore on that same day. And Gruber described it as just a simple composition. But Moore was pleased enough with it that he decided to include it as part of that night's Christmas Eve Mass. Moore sang the tenor part and played the guitar, and Gruber sang the bass part. Very little is known about this first performance on Christmas Eve 1818, but Gruber later described it as receiving, quote, general approval by all. So, Stille Nacht started out as a simple song for Christmas Eve with lyrics by an assistant priest and a melody by a church organist. This is what I really love about this story. They, these were just regular people doing their regular work at their local church, performing for a congregation of laborers and their families, all living at a place that had just come through a war and was struggling economically. And in the years that followed, the song continued to be performed all around this part of Austria. There are surviving copies of the music and lyrics that belong to various teachers, choir directors, vicars, and the like. By the 1830s, the song had started to spread beyond Austria, mostly through traveling groups of family singers. One was the Strasser family singers, who performed the song in Leipzig in 1832. A newspaper article promoting the upcoming concert even said that the writer hoped that they would sing Stille Nacht, meaning that by that point, the song had been performed there before. It is not known exactly how and when the song spread beyond Europe, but the Rainer family singers started a North American tour in 1839, and they performed the song on Christmas Day of that year. But in the process of copying and passing along this music, people had left off the attribution to Moore and Gruber. By the 1850s, folks were trying to figure out who had written this song that at this point had become incredibly popular. Word got back to Gruber about the search, and on December 30th, 1854, he wrote his authentic account of the origin of the Christmas carol, Silent Night, Holy Night. Of course, it was really titled in German. By the turn of the 20th century, Silent Night had been performed in one language or another on almost every continent. Today, it has been translated into more than 300 languages and dialects. It's also remembered as one of the songs sung during the Christmas Eve truce in World War I. In 2011, UNESCO designated it as an intangible cultural heritage. Bing Crosby's 1935 version is reportedly the number three best-selling single of all time. You see that statistic a lot. How they came up with it is a little unclear. And of course, Moore and Gruber both lived their own lives after that first performance of Silent Night and their song becoming so popular. Moore moved from parish to parish on various assignments, becoming known as a social reformer in his later work as a parish priest, and he died on December 4th, 1848. Gruber continued to teach and work as an organist and a choir director. He was married three times, remarrying after the deaths of his first and second wives. He also had at least 12 children, but only four lived to adulthood. One of them, his son Felix, followed in his footsteps as a composer and a musician. Gruber died on June 7th, 1863. The St. Nicholas Church is no longer standing, but today there is a chapel on the former site, known as the Obendorf Silent Night Chapel. The guitar that Moore played also still survives and is in a museum. I find that whole story kind of lovely. Just (laughs) a simple story about a simple song that has stayed around for 200 years. It is very sweet. Uh, I also, before we get into some listener mail, I want to thank Christopher Hasiotis, who did some research for this day in history class about the first publication of A Christmas Carol, which became a part of the research for that part of today's episode. So thanks, Christopher. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.